It's more than just another radio show. It's a beacon of truth. Fasten your seatbelt and find out why they call Deacon Harold Burke Sivers the dynamic deacon. Join Deacon Harold for a fast-paced hour that sheds encouraging light on today's culture. Welcome to Beacon of Truth with your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Beacon of Truth. I am your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and you're listening on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Uh, so great to be with you again today. And, uh, you know, I, like I said, I, I love this time of, of year, uh, these Sundays after Pentecost, where we celebrate uh, two amazing feasts, the, the Solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity uh, and the Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Jesus. And so uh, I always love preparing uh, homilies for this time of year you know it's a really a great opportunity to kind of sit back and reflect upon you know the foundational mysteries of our faith it's a time for at least for me to go back and reflect on uh, my relationship with god you know uh, as he exists as a family as a communion of persons in the trinity and also uh where he exists body blood soul divinity in the eucharist and what does what does that mean for my life uh every day so the, again, that's why I love this time of year. I love reflecting on these mysteries and I love sharing all of this with you, the faithful EWTN uh, radio family, uh, which I've come to, to love over the years. And, you know, I'm so grateful to God for my relationship with EWTN over the years that started, uh, so oh, gosh, almost 20 years ago now. And um, it's just been uh, an incredible blessing in my life. And, and another blessing in my life has been uh, my relation with my friend, Dr. Marcus Peters, who's going to be the guest on our show today. Uh, Dr. Peters is going to talk to us about God's fatherly love in Scripture. Right. So that's uh, that's awesome. God's fatherly love in Scripture. Uh, great topic, especially, you know, uh, you know next month we're going to celebrate uh, Father's Day. And uh, this is going to be important because a lot of people don't really see or understand the fatherhood of God because they've had such negative relationships with their fathers uh, that they can't really relate to God as father because they're dealing with all the the issues um, uh, and, and, and struggles that have arisen due to their own relationship with their earthly father. So they cannot see God as a heavenly father. And, you know, I, I uh, you're all familiar with my story with my dad. Um, even though, again, we didn't speak for 18 years at one point in, in our relationship, uh, I never defaulted to, oh, since I have a bad relationship with with, with my father, then, you know, it, it, that transfers over to my relationship with God. I always saw my relationship with God as transcending my relationship with my earthly father, that even though I didn't get, um, I didn't have the relationship that I wanted with my father, I could still have a, a deep, intimate relationship with my heavenly Father, you know. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about that. God's fatherly love in Scripture. I'm so excited uh, to to bring this to you through again, my friend, Dr. Marcus Peters. Uh, and if you want to be part of the program today, just send us a, an email: beacon at ewtn dot com. And uh, man, I, I again, I love doing this show every day, and th this happens because there are amazing people uh, working to make this show possible every day. We have Matt Kabinsky screening calls. We have Charles Beery doing the social media. And, of course, the producer uh, of all that great music that you hear and, and makes this program run so smoothly, Ace McKay. Ace, how you doing, brother? I'm good, man. I, I love that we're starting to touch on the topic of uh, father relationships because that's immediately how you and I connected having the rough rocky road that we did with our earthly you know DNA father uh, but I remember that moment and I, don't, I, I think I did share this with you but I remember that moment when I was so branded to the identity that I had in my lack of relationship with my earthly father that I remember that moment with God where he was like, he doesn't define you. I do. 
And that was, I mean, you would talk about mm. like just the weight that came off. And that kind of became why I say that so often. Let God be the one who defines you because we all are carrying something in our lives or from our past that may just simply be, well, I'm trying to live up to the standard of either the perfect father or the lack of. Or, or maybe you have a great relationship and you just want to make sure you're doing it as good as they did. So I guess in reality, we kind of all have daddy issues, but it's all a matter of where you are on the spectrum as to whether you're letting your, you know, earthly father or your heavenly father define you. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, you know, and, and uh, part of it is, is too, is because we have certain expectations of parents. You know, um, and, uh, and, you know, and you got to remember, parents, just like priests and just like other people that we look up to are human beings. And uh, they have their faults and they have their struggles, just like everybody else. Yeah. Um, but that fourth commandment kicks in, you know, because, uh, the, again, I, I talked about this before. The Ten Commandments actually in Hebrew in Exodus 20 is the Aseret Hadibrot or the Ten Words of God. Uh, and and there's uh, of course there's ten of them, and number four is honor your father and your mother. You know, and and why is that one important? Well, Jesus, you know, breaks down the the commandments: love God, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, mm -hmm. and so you have uh, uh, one through three, love God, and then five through ten, love your neighbor as yourself. The interesting thing is uh, commandment four is both yeah love god and love your neighbor as yourself you know so it's it's both together why because it's the only commandment that comes with a promise right that your days may be long in the land which the lord your god gives you right so your days may be long in the land which the lord your god gives you so length of days long life yeah so uh so that's the only one that comes with a promise and and yeah and and, and to some extent you know um it, obviously there's going to be factors that that mitigate culpability but parents will be held responsible for um for you know uh how they raise their kids in that relationship and what i love is, is the fact that god is so merciful in his relationship with us and with our parents you know i think about all the years with my dad and then finally at age 74, he gets it, right? right. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he comes to faith in Jesus, you know, and, and it's never too late. You know, Jesus tells that incredible parable of the workers in the vineyard, you know, the guys that worked all day and the guys that came at the end of the day and they got the same pay, they got the same reward. Yeah. So um, I think it's, a you know, in thinking about our fathers and relationships with them, you know, we have to remember that God's mercy is merciful love is never far from those who are open to receiving that that mercy and that love. Well, and it also, if there is a loophole within that, you know, love others as yourself, is we don't typically tend to love ourselves very well sometimes. You know, we talk bad about ourselves or maybe we let voices linger from, you know, parents or people and situations that if we're struggling in loving other people the way that Christ did or wants us to, Maybe we do need to check with how am I loving myself? Because when you say, well, I, I do love others as myself. I, I, I talk down to me and I talk down to them. Well, no, no, no. That's not what that means. You know, we're supposed to up our game because we're learning to love ourselves as Christ loves us. Yeah. And that love has to transcend, uh, you know, the sins of the past, the, the mistakes of the past and even cultural trends. You know, I, I have some guys, so you don't understand what it's like to, in Mexican culture to be a man. and Because, you know, we, we treat our women differently because, you know, we're this culture. Or in my culture, you know, women are, you know, this. And I'm like, oh, what are you, nuts? I said, right. <laughs> we're following the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ain't following no cultural construct. Yeah. You know, and I get how important culture is. And that's great. But that doesn't define who you are. You know, a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ defines who you are. And so um, it's that relationship with Christ that underpins uh, my. So, 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 for example, in my situation, and I'm, I'm in yours too, I'm sure, Ace, is that that relationship and that understanding uh, laid the foundation for my fatherhood, so that I didn't right. make the same mistakes or follow the same path that my father did. Right. 
One hundred percent. Yeah. And being present, as we've talked about on this show before, that is, you know, key. But, you know, going back to, you know, respecting and honoring your father and mother, I think it's important for us as dads to have the discussion with our dads when we do make cultural changes in how we raise our kids or love our spouses or, or live our lives because God has taken hold of us and changed how we do things. And I think that's an important conversation to be prayerfully considering how that then you're honoring them by, look, you taught me a lot, but this is how God is helping me to shape my family. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And we we showed that culture through food and music and other things. So terrific. Yeah, well, we're talking with Dr. Marcus Peters today on God's fatherly love in scripture. You may be part of the program today. You can send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. All right. A little, little, little guitar heavy today, but we're kind of a laid back beat. Right. Well, this is like this is like Great what you power would, like, though. lift weights too. You know, like you know, just like not too yeah. fast, so you don't overdo it. But nice little tempo. You know, do a couple of reps, rest, a couple of reps, rest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice little riff there too. Musical calisthenics, if you will. <laughs> That's it. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> well, you listen to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host. Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and uh, today we're talking with Dr. Marcus Peters about God's fatherly love in Scripture. And if you want to be part of the program, send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. And that uh, great music that we hear every day on the show is brought to you by my producer and friend, Ace McKay. Of course, as uh, we head into the uh, nice long weekend or coming off of it, you know, it's one of those where you get a chance to get deeper in your faith with the extra time that you have. So Sacred Heart of Jesus and Immaculate Heart Prayer Book. It's an ebook available, easy to find when you go online. Go to EWTN.com slash Catholicism and then click the Seasons and Feast Days. <music> All right. Well, when you hear that music, you know it's time for us to break open God's words in the Psalms. And uh, we're using the Revised Grail Psalms, which is approved for use in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And today we're looking at Psalm 134. All right, so 134 is in Book 5 of the Psalms. It's also in a group of Psalms uh, called the Songs of Ascents or Gradual Psalms. These are Psalms 120 to 134 so 134 is the last psalm in that in that series of psalms uh and these are psalms that were sung by worshipers as they traveled to jerusalem for one of three feasts as they ascended the road to jerusalem to celebrate the feast of passover or the feast of unleavened bread the feast of pentecost also called the feast of weeks or the feast of tabernacles also called the feast of booths and these psalms 120 to 134 would have been psalms that they were singing as they were traveling to jerusalem so songs of praise preparing their hearts for worship in the temple so 134 and the prescripts are all very simple for for, for these series of psalms it just says uh, verse one a song of ascents and uh why is it a song of ascents because no matter what direction that you're coming from you're always going up to Jerusalem. So you'll be coming from the south and going north to Jerusalem, you're going up to Jerusalem, but you'll also be coming from the north and heading south, you're still going up to Jerusalem, right? Because Jerusalem was the city uh, of the Lord, that's where the temple was, and uh, and that's where you go up to worship God. So Psalm 134 is pretty short. O come, bless the Lord. All you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the courts of the house of the Lord. All right. So um, this talks about being vigilant day and night uh, that we serve the Lord no matter what we're doing, whether we're even asleep. <laughs> right? In a sense, we're serving the Lord who stand by night in the court. So we have this constant vigil. 
this idea of vigil, being constantly aware of God's presence working in our lives. Verse 2, lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. All right, so that was one of the signs of worship, was lifting our hands uh, in praise. And then finally, verse 3, may the Lord bless you from Zion. Remember, Zion is the uh, the, the the heavenly name of, of Jerusalem. So the earthly name is Jerusalem. The heavenly name is Zion, uh, the, the sacred name. He who made both heaven and earth. So this is a very, very simple psalm, beautiful acknowledgement of God as creator and our relationship with God uh, as a blessing and have to, how we have to be vigilant in our um, uh, in staying in relationship with him because there are so many forces uh, outside of ourselves that are trying to uh, destroy that re that covenant relationship with God. And uh, speaking of covenant relationship, you know, uh, we talked about the fourth commandment a little early in the show. And today we're going to talk about that covenant relationship as it relates to God's fatherly love in Scripture. And to help us to do that, bringing on my friend, Dr. Marcus Peters. Uh, Marcus, welcome to Beacon of Truth. So great to have you with us. The honor is all mine, Deacon. It truly is. It, and, you know, the gift of your friendship, the gift of know, knowing you, first of all, and the influence you've had in my life uh, has been truly something I'm grateful for. But then to be able to do this work of evangelization with you is a blessing I never anticipated. So the honor is all mine, truly. All right. So uh, now some of people may be familiar with you because uh, you've been doing a lot of work uh, on Ave Maria. Uh, radio, which of course is a, a, a EWTN affiliate. So this, but this is the first time you're on this show. So there's uh, a number of That's listeners, right. I'm sure, who are not familiar with you. So if you could just take take mm -hmm. a, uh, some time just to share with us, like kind of your faith journey and your story, so our listeners can get to know who Dr. Marcus Peter is. Sure thing. So. Uh, I, I was born and raised in Malaysia. That's a British Commonwealth nation in Southeast Asia. The British used that as a as a hub of their operations well into the 1900s. Uh, Malaysia only recently gained independence in the in the scale of uh, global history, 1957. So uh, my entire schooling was essentially within the British system. Uh, I was brought up in this empiricist worldview, which is kind of typical for the British. And th what that means is I was schooled to believe that the only thing that mattered was what you could observe under a microscope and what you could see tangibly. And, and that was my gospel. I didn't realize it, but that was my gospel. Now, coupled with that was also this reality that I was getting really concerned about the faith of my ancestors. So uh, I have one small claim to fame. My ancestors were converted by St. Francis Xavier and the early Jesuit missionaries to Asia. So we, we have kind of that claim to fame, but here's the thing. I, I always say this, they didn't finish the job. So we were converted into Catholicism as a family about maybe like four or five generations ago now. But it was a very cultural, nominalistic Catholicism, which categorized the entire experience I had about my faith. So very early on, from a young age, I kept asking questions because I was seeking reasons to believe, as, as is typical of every young man. I, I heard Ace and you share earlier about the sole reality of fatherhood and the crisis of fatherhood we're experiencing and, and how that can affect how we view God's fatherhood. And that's exactly what happened to me. I, I, my father wasn't around growing up. He had one of those jobs that meant I saw him maybe a week in a month. And in that time, God bless the man. He tried really hard, but he, he was distant. I never knew him. I, I'm, I'm only just getting to know him now and I'm 36. So that simply meant that I had to learn for myself what it meant to be a man and what it meant to find truth. And so I, I looked to the scientists and the philosophers that were being given to me. So from a young age, I was exposed to Nietzsche and Kant and Descartes and Hume and Locke. And so you can, you can understand how from there I developed this very atheistic worldview that if science is my God, then there's no room for God. Feuerbach, I don't want to throw out too many names here, but uh, he, he basically made me feel like I could fill in the gap 
that I used to ascribe to God. I don't need a God. And so age 13 onwards, but largely into my late teens, I became a consummate uh, militant atheist. And it was some of the most miserable years of my life. Now, coupled alongside that, I was also, and you know, it's funny, once people know this about me, it seems to be the only thing they remember about me. I was a hip hop artist. I was signed to a label. I was a professional rapper. Uh, because I grew up with a lot of gangster rap. I grew up with artists whom I won't mention on the air right now. I don't know why my parents let me listen to them as a young child. In hindsight, I wouldn't let my son listen to that. But th these these men kind of informed my, my musical, early musical choices. So I became a professional hip-hop artist. And those two years, I was 18 when I was signed to the label, 20 when I left. I left of my own volition because of a conversion experience. Uh, those were some of the darkest years of my life because I had it all. I had, uh, by by worldly standards, I had fame. I, I was making good money. Uh, I was doing well in college at the same time. But what I didn't have was a purpose worth living that was greater than myself. And at age 20, I, I was tricked by some people to going to a charismatic prayer meeting. And I think they were praying for me because... I say tricked because they basically said this, we need a bass guitarist, we know you don't do anything on Tuesday nights, so just come to the prayer meeting and play the bass with us. So that's what I did. But I also told them this, I don't believe in your God, I don't believe in what you do, all I believe in is the fact that I'm a good bassist. And so I went there to show off. I didn't go there to worship God. And what God did for me, I completely didn't deserve. But halfway through the, the praise session, I was hit with this overwhelming experience of the the outpouring of the Father's love from heaven right into my being, and that shattered every wall I had built up in my heart for those 20 years. And as if I knew what I was doing, I said my first prayer of faith. And I still remember it. I said my exact words were, Lord, I know now you are real, and I'm done living like this. So either take me entirely and use me for the glory of your name or leave me to die because I've got nothing else to live for. And my life was changed overnight. I very promptly only wanted to talk about Jesus. I started studying the scriptures as if I knew what I was doing. And I, I, left, I, I left the music label. I left the, the life of being a professional musician because I no longer found any happiness in it. I, I became this bible talking Christian, and in a country like Malaysia, that can get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, it, it's a predominantly <laughs> Muslim nation. And I, 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 all I wanted was to keep talking about Jesus Christ. And just to put into context, in Malaysia, if you talk to a Muslim about any other faith aside from Islam, the Sharia government can capture you and kidnap you with no trial and kill you. And it's well within their rights to do so. Malaysia's odd. It's got a British civil government and a Sharia government operating side by side. And the Sharia government operates without oversight. The, the civil government operates with oversight from the Commonwealth. So... So I knew I was risking my life, but I, I was in love. I was in love for the first time in 20 years, and all I wanted to talk about was Jesus Christ, and I talked about him with everyone. And and very quickly, the the members of the assembly, well, I went to my parents' church, the Catholic church. I went to the pastor, and I said, I just had this powerful experience of Jesus Christ. I know he is God, and I want to give my life to him, but I don't know what to do. Now, I had been brought up to receive all my sacraments, so I had that checked. But I got to tell you, even on the day of my confirmation, I didn't know what a gospel was. I didn't know what mortal or venial sin was. I barely understood what, what confession was or how the sacraments applied. It was just something we did to check the boxes. So I, I'm starting fresh here. I, I, I had some prayers memorized, but, but catechetically I was starting fresh, and Jesus took me under his wing and led me through the study of the scriptures. Eventually, I became Catholic. It was a long journey, but I got there. Wow. So when we come back, that's awesome. We're going to let you uh, continue to tell your story and then dive into God's fatherly love in scripture. To join us, Beacon at EWTN.com. Like that vibe. It's almost like uh, what's that? Is it Richard Gunn or David Gunn? What is that? Uh, yeah. It's 
the the guitar with the yeah, like, like the little whistling. That, I don't even know what effect that is. You probably know more about that than I would, but I just like the harmony of the whistling yeah, it's, over it's, top of it. Yeah, it sounds like a couple different uh, effects pedals that he has working there. But I like that. That kind of like a da na da na da na na na. That kind of the detective. What's that? Yeah. Richard Gunn? Well, I can't remember the name of like that. Peter uh, Gunn, like the Peter Gunn. Like the. Peter Gunn. That's it. Peter Gunn. That's the name. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. Great vibe. Always. We're listening to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. You're listening on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. And uh, you just heard in the last segment, we had an amazing. Uh, uh, initial discussion with Dr. Marcus Peters, who shared his uh, really incredible conversion story, how God has come into his life. We'll hear the rest of that and then dive into our topic, God's fatherly love in scripture. But first, we need to hear from our producer extraordinaire, Ace McKay. Just a quick uh, weekend reminder, Sunday morning's a great way to start off with Light of the East Radio, 1130 Eastern on EWTN Radio, as uh, Father Thomas helps you to explore the rights of Eastern Catholic Church and how can you be a part of that. Easy to do. You can find it uh, Sunday mornings, 1130 Eastern, Light of, East, Light of the East Radio on EWTN Radio. All right. Well, we're talking with Dr. Marcus Peters today on Beacon of Truth. And uh, the last segment, you heard him uh, talk about his conversion story, which was extraordinary. And before before we go on, uh, Marcus, let me ask you: Are you still playing? Actually, yes, I do. I, uh, I I might be owing to my bride's inspiration. I got into building guitars as a hobby because if not, all I'm doing is reading and writing. And she she felt it would make me more human. Her own her words. So <laughs> I, I built my dream bass guitar. I just finished. So I, I play the bass. I play a lot of jazz funk. Uh, if if you know Marcus Miller, he's probably my strongest influence. Oh um, yeah, and of course. Yeah. yeah, so I still play oh, quite a lot excellent. of bass, a lot of jazz funk. Uh, I still rap too. I still break dance, uh, not not <laughs> publicly for performance, just for fun now. Uh, that's awesome. So so just quickly, uh, so two things we uh, I think that the the listeners will want to know. First of all, uh, so you had this amazing conversion experience. Uh, so what? What got you to come from Malaysia to the U.S.? And then how did you meet your wife? And then where did you study to get your doctorate? How, how did all that come about? Okay. So, uh, let's see. Immediately after my conversion, I became an anti-Catholic Protestant. But two years of studying scripture brought me back to the Catholic Church. And then I started traveling and preaching as a Catholic across Malaysia first and uh, into Singapore, and then I entered a religious uh, seminary, a religious organization. I'd like not to mention them because it wasn't the best experience theologically, but they, they then sent me to Singapore, India, the Philippines, and the more I was exposed to different countries and preaching the gospel, the more I realized, A, there was such a need for clinging to the truth of Jesus' church ever deeper, and that the world really needed that, and B, that I needed to be better trained. So in discernment, I discerned out of uh, the seminary, and I felt the Lord call me to Ave Maria University. I applied, I got accepted, and I got my master's degree there in systematic theology. And I, now when I went there, I, I, I need to just very humbly, honestly admit this. I, I, I didn't go there with the hopes of marriage and the family. In fact, I thought the work of proclaiming the gospel was the superior thing and nothing else mattered. And so when I got there, I really felt the Lord tug in my heart that he wanted me, he was calling me to marriage. And I knew that. I knew that implicitly. He doesn't want to do it. So then he puts it in my bride's heart. From the day we met, He, th th this was a gratuitous grace. He speaks to her and tells her, that's the man you're going to marry. Well, we wound up becoming friends for a year and a month, and it took me 13 months to realize that's the woman I was going to marry. So that's where we met, at the library of Ave, Re Ave Maria University, and we were married shortly after. And I got my doctorate from Pontifex University in Georgia. And my doctorate is in biblical covenant, well, officially biblical studies, biblical covenant theology is, is really what I research. And the reason for it is because in my diving into the scriptures, Deacon, what I've come to realize is that the theme of the covenants unlocks and unveils the mysteries of scripture like no other. It is, in my mind, the greatest interpenetrating, overarching theme that allows you to understand the scriptures from page one to the last page as one continuous whole. And most of all is that it brings out 
this infinite, deep, abiding love of God as Father from the first word of Scripture down to the last word of Scripture. So th- that's, that's really my studies, and, and that's, that's why whenever I preach, I'm always talking about we need to reclaim this understanding of God as a covenantal Father, a loving Father. Uh, I love that. And so and that's what we're talking about today, God's covenant love in Scripture. Uh, so, you know, we've talked about the, the meaning of covenant as opposed to uh, the meaning of contract, right? So we mm-hmm. live in a, a culture that emphasizes the contractual relationship, you know, just an exchange of goods, whereas covenant relationship um, is an exchange of persons, right? So, for example, when we go up to receive communion, our Lord Jesus Christ present body, blood, soul, divinity, the Eucharist, that we're saying something, that language of getting up and physically walking toward the altar is saying, you know, there's Jesus. He did his part of the covenant. He, he, uh, his passion, death, and resurrection to overcome the power of sin. So he's there waiting to give himself to us. And when we're walking forward to receive and we're saying with that action, I love you, Lord. I love you more than anyone or anything in this world. I love you so much that I want you to create your life in me, right? And there's that beautiful mm-hmm. exchange. And so this is something, obviously, I mean, it's Dr. Scott Hahn, I mean, his whole thing, uh, his whole foundation of all his teaching is this relationship of covenant. And so you've taken this now and carried it forward, talking about God's fatherly love in Scripture. So, so tell us about what that looks like. Well, first of all, just to go back to exactly what you were saying about this big picture view of what covenants are, we can't talk about God's fatherly love in Scripture, God's covenantal fatherly love in Scripture, if we don't understand and really capture the fact that in a covenant, the the statement here is not this is yours and this is mine, but I am yours and you are mine. We we have this notion of marriage as the most prominent example of covenant in our culture, and and it stands to reason when we stand when I stood on December the eighth, twenty eighteen, at the foot of the altar, professing to my bride those those I basically underwent an oath swearing ceremony. I professed vows to her, essentially saying I am entirely yours and you are entirely mine till death do us part. From that point on, my every thought, word, action, my, the, the money I make, the things I own, we own these things together because we are truly one. Now, when we think about that in terms of the kind of love that God ha- has for us, we've lost this, like you mentioned, in the culture. We think that covenants are like contracts, but they really aren't. Because a contract is what my bride entered into when she bought me that bass amplifier some years ago. What she didn't do, however, so she got me a Fender Rumble. What she didn't do was then invite the salesperson to become a member of our family after the fact. She gave him money, she got the product, and the, the transaction was done. But in the case of God and us, he gives us himself completely by means of the protection and the promises and the the great assurance of his abiding presence in the covenant. And he requests that you and I completely give ourselves back to him. So the language here again is, Father, I am completely yours because you are completely mine. So when you look at from the first pages of Genesis, this language of God enshrining creation in the model of the marital covenant, it's not because God was just kind of interested in human beings and doesn't want them to be lonely. It's more than that. It is because marriage as a covenant, and then as Jesus elevates it into a sacramental covenant, mirrors the inner life, the inner logic, and inner dynamism of the Trinity. In as much as bridegroom gives himself to bride, and bride receives of that love and gives herself back to the bridegroom, and they both beget this one beautiful life that has to be given a name because it is truly life. That is a small mirror of the Trinitarian intimacy of the Father eternally giving himself to the Son. The Son eternally giving himself to the Father. And their love spirating this person of the Holy Spirit. That, and, and, and truly, all of them are begotten, not made one in being because they truly are one in substance. So that's where the analogy breaks down. 
But when we talk about God's covenantal love then, what we need to be able to see is despite our human, biological, earthly fathers failing us, God's fatherly love means he has completely given us himself. If love is diffusive of itself, then the father's heart has completely poured itself out for the sake of his creation, man. And he wants to espouse us into his own covenant family. He wants us to become co-heirs with Christ. He wants us to become reigners of him in heaven. And he's opened the door for all of that to happen in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So that, that's how you really come to see God's fatherly covenant to love from the first pages of the Old Testament until the last page of Revelation. Well, we're talking to Dr. Marcus Peters. You're listening to Beacon of Truth. I am your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And uh, we're talking about God's fatherly love in Scripture. You'll be part of the program today. Send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. Uh, wow, what, what a beautiful uh, exposition on the meaning of covenant as it relates to the family and, and God's uh, inner intelligibility, God's life within himself in, in the, uh, the, the, the nature of the Trinity. So, uh, Dr. Peters, so we you heard us talking, Ace and I talking before, uh, about people who have issues with their fathers, right? And so so often we try to understand who God is. Obviously, we can't fully understand who God is. We have to be God. But when we use analogy, as, as you did so beautifully, you know, like you said, at some point, the analogy breaks down. And, and sometimes because we don't have the best relationship with our fathers, that translates into people's hearts sometimes as, I don't, therefore, can I have a relationship with God, the Father, you see? So so how, so what, yeah. how do you begin to, to think differently to overcome that kind of thinking so we can enter into this beautiful covenant intimacy that you talked about um, uh, so, so beautifully before? You know, Deacon Harold, I'm, I'm going to start by saying something that's going to be so blanket that some that people are going to hear that and go, oh, come on. But genuinely, I'm going to say, read the scriptures. As one who grew up not knowing the loving intimacy of a father, I have to tell you that encountering the love of the father in that prayer meeting drove me to discover who he is in the scriptures. And it's there that I found out that he is for me and not against me that he is there to provide and not to take away, that even in my pain, he is present, that even in my brokenness, he is embracing me, that he is the father who heals me and binds up my wounds because he is close to the brokenhearted. And he is the father who knows the plans that he has for me, plans to prosper me and never to fail me, plans to bring about my hope and my future. He is the father who knows my path, and he wants me to trust him because he alone knows where he is trying to lead me. Now, that's kind of the blanket statement, right? But I'm also going to say this. A big part of this for us is maturing in our, whole, our own human natural life. That as we grow up, we start seeing the failings of our parents. And that's not a bad thing like you mentioned. Our human parents are flawed because they are fallen human parents. And in as much as the best of them strive for saintly virtue, the fact of the matter is none of them are going to perfectly mirror the loving heart of the Father. So trust that in the failure of our earthly father, God the Father can heal even that wound. And by the way, psychology has a term for this. It actually is called the father wound. Some of the worst figures in history, the figures who have created the, the most waves in history of destruction, and you, you can think about people like Lenin and Stalin, Adolf Hitler, but you can also think about Nietzsche. You can also think about Dederay and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. These men share this one thing in common, or, or Freud. These men share these one thing, this one thing in common. All of them had a father wound. And, and I'm not making this up. The studies mm. are proving this. That even sociology is coming to see that there really is a need for us men to step up and be true mirrors of the fatherhood of God. Pope Benedict XVI, I consider he, he became a father to me when I didn't have a father. And to this day, I think of, I tell, I tell my children, this is Dada's Dada, you know, this is, this is Dada's father. And, and so there's a picture of him at home and, and I talk to them about him because 
even in the failure of our human fathers, God has given us a covenant family that has fathers and mothers at varying levels to, to make up for that lack. The church makes up for what human society cannot feed. So think about this. We have the Pope who, from the Latin word father, is literally spiritual father to us. And then those who are in communion with him, we have the cardinals and the bishops and the priests and the deacons who all embody different levels of spiritual what? Fatherhood. So much so that when they look at these people, when people look at you, Deacon Harold, they see a mirror of God's fatherhood in a very tangible way. And so the love that we lack from our biological fathers is made manifest in the covenantal family of God on earth. And the same is true for spiritual mothers, that mother superiors and sisters and consecrated virgins all manifest spiritual motherhood to make up for that which is lacking in biological motherhood and fatherhood. So that's another area that we can start at. But then finally, this is a very practical thing. We cannot claim to experience the love of someone if we don't seek to know them. I, even as a father right now, my children, because they know me, know that Dada loves them. And so I'm always working at expressing that. But most of all, because as I get to know them and they get to know me, they trust that Dada is here to keep them safe and that Daddy loves them. We need to get to know our Father. And that draws me back to the first thing I said. That's why we read the Scriptures. That when we read the Psalms and we say God is, and we see God is close to the brokenhearted, or when we take a look at Proverbs and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Seek the Lord in all that you do and He will direct your path. It's because He's a good Father that He does that. Or we look at Jeremiah that I alone know the plans that I have for you. That's not a bad person. That's a good, loving father. So Pope Benedict, he, he said this in his address in Palermo at, at some point that he was visiting there. He said this, the crisis of fatherhood we're experiencing today is a basic aspect of the crisis that threatens mankind as a whole. So to that end, the final exhortation, Deacon Harold, is Men, my brothers, we need to rise up to become the true mirrors of manhood that the fathers made us to be, to become like Christ and like Joseph in all things, laying down our lives for our brides and our children as Christ loved the church, that we may purify them by the gift of water and the word, and that we may present them to the Father spotless on the day of judgment. This is what we are called to, and we're never going to be happy until we are living that out in fullness. All right. Well, you're listening to Beacon of Truth. I am your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. You're listening on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. And today we're talking with Dr. Marcus Peter about God's fatherly love in Scripture. And uh, he's, he's just given us a beautiful exhortation uh, on God's fatherly love in the Scriptures. And so uh, why don't you give us some examples uh, we say God's Father love in Scripture, and, and you start off by saying, you know, read the Scripture is kind of, a, you, as you said, this blanket statement. But it's a blanket statement that's full of power and full of truth, right? Mm -hmm. So so, so, so if I'm a person now listening to him like, wow, what Dr. Peter said was just so beautiful. You know, like where in the Scriptures can I find this? What verses should I be looking for? So wh wh what, where would you point them? What direction would you uh, have them go into to to delve more into the Word of God. So being being that I look at the theme of covenants in Scripture, one of the most prominent covenants in the Old Testament is the Abrahamic covenant. And it's a very explicit narrative of God elevating the commitment of his love to Abraham. So what I'd recommend is you, you take a look at God's call to Abraham in Genesis 12 and read that all the way until Genesis 22. In Genesis 12, God calls Abraham, and you're going to miss this in the English, but the language here in the Hebrew is lek leka. There's a kind of, there's a kind of urgency here, a, a kind of onus and impetus to get up and go. Now, the, uh, the rabbinic midrash that comments on this t says that this was God protecting Abraham by telling him to get up and go right now. Uh, and and the, the best part is this, he's 75 years old. But to God, Abraham is a child. Abraham, Abraham is his child. So Avram, Abram, 
is called by the father with barely anything except the tribe that he leads. And he takes Abram through the wilderness and leads him to what will eventually be known as the land of Canaan that will eventually become Israel as a nation and tells him this land will be yours. This land is yours. And as a good father, he says, I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you kingship and a name. And I'm going to make your descendants as multitudinous as the stars in the, in the sky or the sand on the seashore. And God has his hand over Abraham. So many times Abraham could have lost his life or he could have lost everything. And God never fails him. Now, Abraham goes through this whole struggle of trusting God, not trusting God, so that when, when we come up to the Genesis 22 narrative of Abraham being called to sacrifice Isaac, the reason why God stops Abraham's hand is because what God was calling Abraham to do, God as a father was going to do infinitely more in the future. Abraham, the righteous father, was stayed from sacrificing his only begotten son because God, the true righteous father, was going to send and sacrifice his only begotten son as a true expression of fatherly love for the salvation of all mankind. When we look at how much God loves Jesus, when we look at how much God protects Job despite everything he goes through and restores blessings to him many fold after the, the issues that he goes through, when we look at how God protects not only Noah and his family, but Adam even after the fall, when we look at David and despite his great failure, that God still professes a covenant to him. He fails after the fact, but God professes a covenant to him that that I will build in you a house. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11. I will build in you a house, a dynasty. As you read all of these things, in grand picture, you start seeing the love of the Father. And then as you read, for example, Acts 10, which we heard as a reading last Sunday, when God tell, gives gives Peter this vision of the unclean meat and tells him kill and eat. And it says Peter was hungry and desired to eat. And then he is sent to the house of Cornelius and he baptizes them. We are suddenly made to realize God doesn't, God is no respecter of persons. His love is free for all who profess faith in him. So literally it's, it's not just a question of where do we find this in scripture it's also a question of where do we not find this in scripture so what I'd recommend is putting on the lens of the fatherly love of God and reading through it now mind you you're going to find some weird f verses like um, the story of Elisha calling the, the two she bears to maul the children how do you see God's fatherly love there well okay he protected Elisha but but he also mauled children, right? So it, it's tough to pick up in those particular instances but in the grand narrative God is truly father in a greater way than our earthly fathers are. So that by the time we get to the book of the Revelation, you get the wedding feast of the Lamb. One of the great honors of Jewish culture for a father was the wedding of his children. He was, he, that he would be able to present his son to her bride or present his daughter to the bridegroom. And that's exactly what God the Father does in presenting us, the new Jerusalem, to Christ the true bridegroom in one eternal heavenly Eucharistic wedding banquet. That's the culmination of God's fatherly love for us. Yeah, Revelation 19, verse 9, right? Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. I love that. I love that. Well, you're listening to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and we're talking to Dr. Marcus Peter on God's fatherly love in Scripture. Well, Dr. Peter, we only have... Um, a couple minutes left. So so I, I've been listening to the program and I'm going, my heart is on fire right now. And man, Dr. Peter just you know knocked it out of the park. I love the connection with scripture. So in just the, the, the short time we have left, how does that translate to my own life personally now as, as a husband, as a father? I want to do better. And so how do I, and I read these scriptures, how do I now make that part of my lived experience? I love that you asked that question because that's exactly what I do. Applied biblical theology. I want to recommend if you if you're interested in reading more of like this kind of applied biblical stuff, I write on marcusbpeter.com and and I'm always putting stuff out there. But just in a very quick exhortation for men especially, Ephesians 5 tells us husbands love your brides as Christ loved the church. And how does he love the church? Laying his life down for her that he might purify her by water and the word. 
My exhortation then, find different snippets throughout the day where you can die to self for the sake of your bride and your children. The more selfless we become, the more we become like the Father, the more we become like Jesus Christ, the more we become like Joseph. And that's how we apply God's covenantal love in our life. Whoa, that's awesome. What a beautiful way to, to end the program today. Again, we're talk, we just had a great conversation with Dr. Marcus Peter on God's fatherly love in scripture. Well, tomorrow we're going to talk, we're going to look at Swimming Upstream, a live presentation. And uh, until then, remember, you can stream today's show by visiting Podcast Central at ew10.com slash radio. And until we're together again, my friends, may Almighty God bless you, keep you and protect you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>